It's good to have all of you here tonight. We're in for a treat. Sergio, Michelle, excuse me, Natalie, Michelle, and Sergio, all four of them have really endeared themselves to our congregation. And through our correspondence, I found out that Sergio has been preaching in the Ukraine. And so he's been now here tonight, and we talked about him speaking for us tonight. He has a marvelous lesson for us. So uh, get your Bibles ready. Sergio, preach the word. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, it works. Um, good evening, church family. It's a particular pleasure and honor to be here as I'm away from home, but uh, we have made our second home here, both in Myrtle Beach and in this church. So I thank Stephen and the uh, elders for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, and uh, I thank my wife for spurring the side of my intent. As Stephen said this morning that uh, we need wives. Amen. Um, the uh, subject that I would like to speak about today is called uh, keeping focus. And in keeping focus, I need to flip the... There we go. Uh, keeping focus on the things of God. I uh, re was reading a book on uh, personal leadership, and I came across a quote that said a person without character does not truly belong to himself, but he or she belongs to whatever can get hold of him. And when I read that quote, I paused and I thought, what in my Christian life is my character? And who do I really belong to on a consistent basis, not on in, in just in pure theory as a Christian? And I researched the topic a little bit, uh, and then I decided to expand it. So going into the definition of character, first of all, uh, we look at Merriam-Webster and applying Christian topic to, uh, the, uh, to the word, we look at connotation number three that says that uh, character is moral excellence and firmness, which can be understood as a person's firm decision to follow his or her moral convictions. And when we look at the Bible, we have a number of strong positive examples of how character is displayed, how a person's strong moral convictions and moral, moral excellence and firmness can be played out in real life. And one of the best examples was just read this morning in Scripture, uh, just before, in Scripture reading, uh, where Joshua assembled the people of Israel after the conquest of Palestine was as over as it was at the time. And uh, he told them, people, God has taken you out of slavery in Egypt, where the people were generally following those idols. He brought you to a land of Canaan, where he drove from before you all these people that were following idols and worshiping and practicing all these evil things. And you're now living in houses that you did not build. You're reaping the vineyards which you did not plant. And you saw all of this, how God did this for you, so now you choose whom you're going to worship and follow. The true God or all these idols. And then Joshua's character comes to the fore where he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No matter what people around us do, no matter what happens, what's going on around us, we have the character when we can follow through on our moral beliefs, on our Christianity. Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also facing a life and death situation where the king built the statue and, this, and he said, whoever does not bow before the statue gets thrown into the furnace and the three men did not bow. And when they were brought to the king, they said, with respect, king, you are a political leader and we will obey the, law, the laws of the land as uh, good subjects should, but we will not worship you. You are not our God and you're not above God. And even if you throw us into the fire, and there their character is displayed in this one phrase which always inspires me, but even if God does not deliver us from the fire, 
Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. We are faced with situations in life all the time where we have a choice of shortcut or the straight road. Daniel was facing a similar situation, life and death situation with the lions. Um, and uh, we don't have a quote from him, but he stood his ground. He stood his faith. He stood his belief in God, and he did not yield. And Ruth and Nehemiah is a very interesting story, where Nehemiah and her husband, they moved to the land of the Midianites in search of... Uh, food because there was famine in Israel and after a while uh, his sons married and they died and Nehemiah was left without men in the house and her daughters-in-law were also without men and Nehemiah uh, and uh, Nehemiah said I'm going back and her daughters-in-law were not really sure at first but then Ruth said I am following you no matter what happens to you and here is her character. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I die. Doesn't matter what circumstances around us are, we can display our character in cases of adversity. And Jephthah's daughter is another great example where she was a little bit of a hostage of her father's rash oath. When she saw him coming towards her, she was happy, but he was really stricken because he knew that he opened his mouth before the Lord. And, and Jephthah's daughter was in a little bit of, an, uh, of a dilemma here, but she really stood her ground. And she said, my father, if you have given your word to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. She stood her moral ground. She stood her, and she really displayed her excellence. Now, character is not a thing of itself. Character proceeds out of our belonging. And if we belong to the Lord, our character proceeds out of this belonging. And it gives us the source, the source of strength, the source of character. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul tells us, and I will be changing your, throughout the quotes, into our, to give more application to our life. And Paul says, or do we not know that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us, whom we have from God, and we are not our own? For we were bought at a price, therefore let us, Glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. And it's very important to note here the plural at the end, are God's. Oftentimes when Christians become, well, people become Christians, we tend to think that our spirits are God's. But it's not only. It says here that our entire existence belongs to God, both our body and our spirit. And we need to serve God with our entirety. So we belong to him, and we, when we realize this belonging, then our character comes into play. And when we were visiting schools with my family, we were in one school, and I saw this very nice sign on the plaque there, which said, if you cannot be a good example, you will just have to be a horrible warning. And in the Bible, we have both. We have great examples, and we have horrible warnings. And sometimes both in one. Solomon, in the beginning, he was a great example. A man of God whom God blessed beyond what he could think or dream of. But in the end, he gave himself over to his foreign wives. He gave himself over to idols. He built the shrines, which led to the breakup of one of the mightiest kingdoms at the time. And which led to this very tragic story of Israel's apostasy and their capture and the death and destruction which Jeremiah describes in Lamentations, which was terrible, and not the Lamentations only. So we have an opportunity each time when we think about ourselves to think, how does our behavior, how does our belonging to God or not to God affect our life and the life of those around us, of our children and of our uh, descendants 
and of the people around us, our church. Samson was also a man of God who had his weaknesses and he gave himself over to a foreign woman who then gave him in to the enemies and then God, well, God deprived him of the power. They deprived him of the hair. But then he repented and God gave him the power back for just a short period of time. And one of the best examples of the favorite examples is actually Mary. When Gabriel appeared to her and said, Mary, you're going to bring forth a child without a husband. And we now understand, but she could not possibly understand how that could be possible. And bringing forth a child without a husband in that society was a very different thing to bringing a child forward without a husband in our society. She could be stoned, she could be put to death, she would be at least put to shame for the rest of her life. But she says to Gabriel, without full understanding of what's going on, behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. What if our lives are that way? I belong to the Lord. Let it be to me, even when I may not understand everything, according to your word. So in our house, in our life, in our soul, we can have either demons or the Lord. Just like in that proverb where Jesus said that the demon leaves the house, wanders about, comes back, it's clean, and then he brings a bunch of others with him, and when the house is empty, they enter. If we do not belong to the Lord, we belong to the world, to things, material items, passions, ideas, and philosophies. In other words, wisdom of men. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.5 that our faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He is comparing the wisdom of men, which is the weakness of men, with the power of God. Just like the scales that Belshazzar saw. So how do we maintain our belonging? It's not something that just comes out of nowhere. The character that just does not produce itself. We have to create it. We have to maintain it. And we do that by constantly focusing on our Christian life, on what God wants of us, on everyday things, on everyday Christian living. And that way we will be able to reaffirm our belonging and build our character. And when we think about focusing, we think about cameras. And cameras are built on the principle of the eye, which can focus well only on one thing uh, close or the thing far from us. If we hold our hand in front of us and you look at me, then you will only see me and your hand will be blurry. You will have ten fingers and two hands at the same time. And I am more important to you. But if you look at your hand, and not at me, your hand becomes more important and I become blurry. And we think, we tend to focus on the creation instead of the creator, because this is what we see with our eyes. And we tend to be centered about the material. I was flying here in an airplane and I flipped through the onboard magazine and it was full of nice pictures of very nice things, of accessories and yachts and real estate and beautiful beaches, and it kind of induces us to love these things, to love the material. But Paul writes to us in 2 Corinthians 4.18, do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When we look at the material, we're looking at the creation, we're looking at the temporary. And we, when we look at the things of God, we look at the, at, at the eternal, and we see the purpose of the material. When we, when, we, when we play the ball game, or any game, we have to focus on the ball, or we will lose out, especially in a seasonal competition. And Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.5, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And we have here the, the, the playbook of our life. These are the rules. 
if the, the, we compete according to this book. And Christian living is a life of nonstop, nonstop focus on two principal things. On the source of our motivation to live the Christian life, first of all, and that is the goal of our Christianity, uh, why Christ came to this world. And second is the means to achieving the goal. And I apologize, I had my slides in the vertical way and they are here in horizontal. Um, so I don't necessarily see the same thing I see on the screen. But our goal and our prize and our reward are greater than anything that we can ever have in this world. This is why we're living through this life in the way that God wants us to live. P uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Nothing in this world we have is undefiled or incorruptible. No real estate, no cars, no yachts, no, no, nothing we see is incorruptible or undefiled. Everything requires maintenance and everything becomes old and perishes. But God has created for us something which lasts for eternity and where there is no maintenance cost. Everything's been taken care of. In 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearance. To all who have loved his appearance. We will all be winners if we follow God's commandments, if we live according to the playbook. In Revelation 21 and 22, there is a very broad description of what eternity will be like, of how blissful a state we will have. Nothing to compare with anything we can ever hope for in this life. doesn't matter how many goodies we collect. He says that in eternity there will be no night, no pain, no sorrow, no crying, and no death. No trouble, in other words. No problems of this life. We will not worry about anything anymore. There, we will inherit all things. We can never inherit all things by pursuing things of this world, by giving ourselves over to this world. We may inherit something, but it will be a very, very ignorable portion, just a bowl of soup compared to the inheritance that God has prepared for us. And we shall reign forever. Forever, we shall be kings with Jesus, kings and queens, I guess, uh, no sex over there, uh, no, no gender. Uh, we will reign there forever. So it's above anything we can ever hope for in this life. And then there is the means to achieving the, that goal. It doesn't come just naturally by itself. We have to live a life of belonging to God, a life of displaying character. We rarely happen to go to heaven just tomorrow where we do not have to go through the life. Typically, we have to go through the life. Very few people are baptized just before their death. We typically live 10, 20, 30, 50, sometimes more years before we reach heaven, before we reach the end of this life. And these are the tools to achieving the goal, to show God that we have these moral standards that we can adhere to. And one of them is naturally reading the Bible. And I haven't been flipping the pages, uh, but one of them is reading and studying the Bible. Jesus talking to, the, to, to, to Satan at the end of his fasting, when he was really hungry after 40 days, I don't think anybody of us have, have been hungry for 40 days. Maybe some have, but very few. Uh, and he tells the Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In a very similar way, Job writes in 23.12, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. More than my necessary food. Both of these comparisons are with food, 
spiritual food versus uh, natural, physical food. And each time we sit down to eat, we have an opportunity to think, are we focusing on the material? And how much are we focusing on the material? How much are we feeding ourselves? Do we treasure God's word more than we treasure the physical food? How much more? Or maybe not quite. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 talks about the importance of, uh, of, of the scripture. It says that it's given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, instructions in righteousness. Why? To make a Christian, well, perfect may not be the best word, complete, entire, as, as good to God as we can be. Because without Christ, we, we, we're nothing to God. And only Christ presents us as blameless. Only God presents us without sin. I mean, only Christ when we come to God. And reading the Bible and living by the playbook, we are making ourselves complete. Nothing else in this world can make us complete before God. Only this book. And in 2 Timothy, just a couple of verses down, he says, Preach the word, he tells Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. And if preaching and teaching is good in season and out of season, it automatically means that being taught and being preached to is good in season and out of season. There is no wrong time to read, to learn, to listen, to, to, to be taught by God. And, that, and the Bible teaches us that our belonging is not to us, it's not to the world. It kind of takes us away from this world. And second is proper thoughts. And much attention is given to proper thinking by personal development psychologists and teachers. The Bible is the source of this information. It tells us in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, on these things meditate. Focus, in other words, on these things. Because our thinking produces action. The more we think about something, the more we are inclined to do that. And if our thoughts are good, lovely, just, pure, noble, praiseworthy, our actions will follow. Our actions will be just like that. And if we think, if, if we don't think about these things, the world throws all of its information onto us. We will download everything from the world in an instant, 5G, very fast. And our house will be full with those demons that the one we kicked out brings back. Next, doing good works. And it's a very big subject in the Christian world. Many teach that it's enough to be baptized and to say, yes, I repent and now I belong to the Lord. And many don't even teach baptism. But once you have become Christian, it's, it, it, that's enough. You come to church once, twice a week, maybe three times. You pray sometimes and that's it. But that's not what the Christian life is about. Because in, in the same passage where Paul in Philippians talks about us being saved by grace, he goes on two verses down, says Ephesians 2.10, for... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For we are his workmanship, in, uh, for, uh, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are created to do good works. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. And this is very much the definition of character. Steadfast and immovable in moral convictions. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we will display our character by always abounding in the work of the Lord. James says in James 2 twice that faith without works is dead. In other words, our faith is good for nothing if we do not confirm it with active Christian living by serving the Lord, just like we had the lesson this morning and the previous Sunday. 
First Peter, no, James 4.17 says, It is sin to us to know to do good and not do it. And this is a very, very hard passage, but it is so. The Bible teaches us that way. When we can do good, when we know to do good, we should do it. Next point is standing firm in trials. Um, and trials, it's another contentious subject of a Christian community. Some teach that once we become Christians, God puts us in a sort of a environment, like lab environment, where we should be protected from all interference with the negative factors of this world. That we should live healthy, wealthy, taken care of, away from all sort of trouble. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. It tells us that all, in 2 Timothy 3.12, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution in no doubtful terms. All, not many, not most, not some, but all, and not may suffer persecution, but will suffer persecution. If we do not suffer persecution, probably we're not living Christian enough life. Because the world does not like the way of life, of, uh, the Christian way of life. James tells us, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We should count it joy when we fall into trials, knowing that our faith is producing patience, our, uh, preparing us for the next trial to come. And Peter says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happening to you. Trials are not strange. Trials are the reason for us to say that I am going through, God is sending me something great, a reason to rejoice. Like Paul in prison was singing. We have an opportunity to rejoice when we're going through trials, knowing that we're living a Christian life. And uh, the final of the five I put together is abstaining from the lust of the flesh. And this is a big one. It's, it, we are now living at the time when the values are being se severely altered, like Brother Billy said this morning uh, in class. What was sin a while ago isn't being presented like sin at all anymore. And I recently w heard a version of the Bible up north in Maine when I went to, to a meeting, to a church uh, service, which kind of has such a wonderful wording that there is no sin in sexual immorality anymore. You, cannot, you, you do not understand immediately that sexual immorality is sinful, but it doesn't change what God teaches us. Uh, Paul says when we walk in the Spirit or when we focus on the things of God, when we read His Word, when we do His works, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh or the works of the flesh. And then he lists this big list of bad things, of sexual immorality and jealousy, selfishness, selfish ambitions, dissensions, etc. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he has the list as well. And the common thing about these two, the common point about these two lists is that people who practice such thing will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in Corinthians, Paul says, do not be deceived. We're deceiving ourselves if we prefer the translation that says it's okay to be sexually immoral. It's, it's not going to happen. There is no way to heaven if we practice these bad things. And, and the last uh, of these items is in, in John 1, 2, 5, 15, 16, where John says, do not love the world. It comes from this uh, onboard magazine. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, not some things, not most things, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these things are not from the Father, but of the world. Not the things of this uh, material thing are not of the Father, but the lust is not of the Father. When we take our focus off of God, our focus falls on the things, on material, on what's around us. And we become lustful. 
We want ever more. There is never enough. Our, our eyes will always want to see more. Our desire to have more will never be satiated. So keeping focus is a paramount thing for a Christian. We need to remember that God expecting from us to show faithfulness on a daily basis, not just on the day that we are baptized. And that faithfulness is displayed by words and by works. And I can combine here two verses from Joshua 24, 14, with which we started, and 1 Peter 1, 4. Joshua says, Now therefore, let us fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. As obedient children, not conforming ourselves to, to the former lusts as in our ignorance, because our ignorance is, not former, is now former. We, we're not ignorant anymore, and we are in that way inexcusable. But as he who called us is holy, that we also be holy in all our conduct, in all our conduct, because it is written, be holy as I am holy, as God is holy. Let us pray. Our great Father in heaven, we thank you very much for your numerous blessings. And first of all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who came into the world and shed the light of salvation for everyone who believes in him. He opened the door to heaven for every person on the face of this world. And we ask you, Lord, to help us on a daily basis to focus on our faith, to focus on our relationship with you, to study the word, to do your works, and to spread the good news as best we can. Bless in each and every one of us, as, of us as we try to serve you and give us the opportunities to serve and the willingness to do so. We thank you for loving us and thank you for Lord Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people were baptized that day and added to the New Testament church. Tonight, you have that same invitation. You can become a New Testament Christian tonight. Come forward and be baptized into Christ. If you've not been living a life as you should as a Christian, you can come forward tonight. We'll pray with you and for you to get focused with God again. Will you come?